Good afternoon. I would like to talk about the imaging of pregnant women, the challenging two-in-one imaging and the safety considerations for the cardiothoracic imaging. Imaging in pregnancy is known to have certain challenges. First of all, we are dealing with altered hemodynamics, where approximately 40% increase in plasma volume is known to happen in the first 24 weeks of gestation that is resulting in increase in cardiac output and increase in the heart size. There is also a known Virho triad, which is a hypercoagulability, venous stasis, and vascular damage, all leading to the increased rate of pulmonary embolism and deep venous thrombosis. From the safety aspect, we are dealing with two-in-one imaging, where the imaging techniques, which are optimal for the mother, might be harmful for the fetus. That's why the well-accepted and currently available imaging modalities, such as CTA, MR, ultrasound, and VQ scan, all have their pros and cons. Let's start with talking about the safety aspects of CT imaging. And when we talk about the CT imaging, we are separating between the radiation exposure to the fetus to the radiation exposure uh, to the mother. And we also would like to talk about the administration of iodine contrast material and the consequences for lactation. So when we're talking about CT safety aspects of the fetal radiation, we differentiate between the stochastic and deterministic effects. Stochastic effect or carcinogenesis has no threshold, as we know, and it has been extrapolated from the atomic bomb survivors and anatomical and uh, animal experiments that more than 50 milligray exposure is required to increase the relative risk twice. When we are talking about teratogenesis or deterministic effect, no adverse effects were documented below the level of 100 milligray exposure. Between 100 and 150, the defects are rare. More than 150, it's probably time to consider possible fetal damage and termination of pregnancy, which is definitely recommended if the fetal exposure of more than 200 has happened. There are three mechanisms of radiation exposure to fetus during cardiovascular imaging, which is usually not a direct imaging of the fetus. So in the first case, when we're talking about CT, fluoroscopy, or chest radiograph, we are dealing with scattered radiation or Compton radiation. When radiopharmaceuticals are used, they can be irradiating fetus from outside if they're not crossing the placenta barrier or from inside if they are crossing the placenta barrier. Based on the quality of exposure and amount of the exposure and proximity to the fetus, there were certain doses to the fetus established for different types of cardiovascular imaging. For example, pulmonary CTA has the widest range, but it's still less than one milligray, and the highest one would be myocardial perfusion with technetium cestamibi. If we are reviewing the radiation to the fetus from CT VQ scan or background, they will all be way less than two milligray and definitely less than the known amount for the substantial deterministic or stochastic effects. When we are talking about the radiation to the mother, we are facing a different problem. There is a substantial estimated breast radiation of more than 30 milligray from a CTPA or cardiac CT which is equivalent to approximately 10 mammograms and substantially increases the lifetime relative risk for breast cancer. With BQ scan, on the other hand, the estimated breast radiation is small and it's pretty much 1% when compared to CTPA. What can we do to improve the situation? Obviously, we can optimize the parameters for the radiation when we are talking about the CTPA to bring it way below than 150 milligray per centimeter. And when we in our practice have implemented those parameters, we have recorded breast radiation of less than five milligray. What else can be done? There is organ specific dose modulation approach where the anterior portion of the chest where the breast tissue is located is receiving substantially decreased current. Uh, the problem with this approach is unfortunately substantial amount of breast tissue is not included in this reduced dose zone. Well, we conducted a, an experiment and compared 
the uh, women population in two centers in Belgium and US, we have seen that the breast tissue was located in the increased dose zone in almost 100% of women lying supine and 82% of women lying prone. Can we do something to improve that? Yes, something very simple. Wearing a bra would substantially improve the amount of tissue which will be in the reduced dose with approximately 97% of women wearing it having breast tissue located in the low dose zone. Shielding is a controversial issue and the breast dose reduction was reported of being more than 30%, similar to the organ-based dose modulation, but with subsequent increase of bone marrow dose through the spine radiation and substantially more artifacts detected. The other type of shielding, which is more appropriate or more widely used is the shielding by barium, when the barium is administered to a woman before the examination. So if we compare the pulmonary CT angiography and ventilation perfusion scintigraphy, we basically see that they both have advantages and disadvantages as we know, but it goes down to the fetal dose and maternal dose comparison. And given the substantial dose that is given to the maternal breast, we can see that this was leading to the American Thoracic Society document releasing the guidelines of assessment of pulmonary embolism in pregnancy. Based on those guidelines, after chest radiograph is taken, only if it's abnormal, the next step would be CT pulmonary angiography. Otherwise, the woman is supposed to undergo assessment with ventilation perfusion. Only if the ventilation perfusion is non-diagnostic, she can have CT pulmonary angiography. The next step would be to discuss IV eogenated contrast. It's known to cross the placenta and be excreted by fetal kidneys. It has the potential to produce neonatal hypothyroidism when administered in therapeutic doses, but no effect so far was reported when we are talking about administration of iodine for diagnostic imaging. American College of Radiology 2010 criteria have proposed the use of iodinate contrast media to pregnant patients if needed. Now, if iodine has been administered, neonatal thyroid functions should be checked, but they're checked anyway in all newborns in the United States. And no interruption of lactation is recommended as by the American College of Radiology contrast manual released in 2010, which is an important fact to know when dealing with patients in the postpartum period. Let's switch gears and talk about MRI safety aspects. When we are dealing with the MRI, we don't deal with ionizing radiation, but there are other problems that potentially can affect the fetus, such as tissue heating at different field strengths, teratogenesis, acoustic damage, and we also have to discuss the injection of gadolinium and the consequences for lactation. American College of Radiology white paper on MR safety has stated that pregnant patients should undergo MRI only if the required information cannot be obtained the infor otherwise, the information is likely to alter patient care, and the examination cannot wait until after completion of pregnancy. Why? Because there are certain safety issues with MRI, such as cell migration, proliferation, and differentiation related to the static MR field. Pulse radiofrequency field can cause tissue heating and organogenesis defects. And variant gradient electromagnetic field can cause potential damage to fetal ear due to high acoustic noise level. Specific absorption rate, or SAR, is regulated by FDA. And those are the units that are assessing the tissue heating. SAR units do not currently exist for pregnant patients separately. Since the majority of the heating is superficial, for procedures compliant with the IEC normal mode condition, fetal SAR and fetal temperature are within the international safety limits. To be on the safe side, it's accepted widely that three Tesla is not used in pregnancy and only 1.5 Tesla is used. Han and colleagues have conducted an experiment involving a phantom that was simulating 26 week pregnant woman. And what they have done is the numeric quantification of local temperature changes and SAR with 1.5 Tesla and three Tesla magnets. What they have found that fetal effects are within the international safety limits for SAR less than two. There were no scientific evidence recorded in humans of teratogenesis that was uh, conducted in an experiment 
up to nine years after MRI examination. And when we are talking about the acoustic damage, the MRI noise level can approach 80 to 100 decibels, but estimated fetal noise due to attenuation by mother body is not more than 30. The American Academy of Pediatrics proposed a 90 decibel limit for the fetus that can potentially affect its ear. So no scientific evidence in humans of acoustic damage has been found so far. Now let's talk about the gadolinium administration during pregnancy. We know that it crosses the placenta, it's excreted by the fetal kidneys, but there is no evidence of teratogenesis in human, although there is sporadic evidence of animal teratogenesis when high and repeated doses were administered. Toxic free gadolinium is minimal, but it is accumulated, but the mother to fetus concentration is 100 to 1, and no fetal adverse effects related to renal failure were documented. By US FDA classification, it's a category C agent, which is administered if the potential benefit justifies a potential risk to the fetus. The ACR states at this point that there is no sufficient evidence to conclude no risk, and that's why gadolinium should not be given unless absolutely necessary. If gadolinium has been administered, no neonatal tests necessary, and we know that less than one hundred of a percent is excreted in the breast milk. So that's why there is no need to interrupt lactation similar to iodine contrast. So let's talk about some practical algorithms in assessment of the cardiovascular diseases or cardiotrophic diseases in pregnant women. There are selected indications for imaging modalities involving ionizing radiation in pregnancy. For example, coronary angiography is justified when acute coronary syndrome is suspected or there is a suspicion for coronary artery dissection. Coronary CTA would be appropriate in patients with suspected coronary disease, which is not that infrequent given the increasing age of patients having their children. CTA can be used when there is a suspicion for PE in the presence of abnormal chest radiograph or suspected aortic dissection. VQ scan is recommended now at the first line for patients with suspected PE and normal chest radiograph. Also, there are selected MRI indications in pregnancy, such as myocardial malfunction that cannot be assessed with echocardiography, congenital cardiovascular anomalies in mother, and different aortic pathologies that also cannot be evaluated uh, after pregnancy. Pulmonary embolism evaluation with MRI is possible, but it's technically challenging and only can be done if there are appropriate resources available. So when a CT is considered in pregnancy, we suggest a certain algorithm that goes through the all stages of the assessment of the pregnant patient requirement for CT examination. And what is also important is the discussion between the clinician and radiologist about the study, the need for the study, if the study can be postponed, and if another modality, which is non-ionizing modality, can be used. Similar algorithm we suggest for MRI, where basically the important question is if the MRI can be postponed, and again, if MRI can be uh, exchanged by a different study, in this case, ultrasound. The next question to answer, is gadolinium necessary or not? And if necessary, what is the dose that has to be administered? And the last thing I would like to talk about is the medical legal aspects of imaging in pregnant patients. Obviously, the most important thing is that the informed consent is essential. And I know it's to some degree controversial, but in our department, we consent for all but ultrasound studies of pregnant patients. The radiology facility should have a process for evaluating pregnant women, and the discussion with patients about the risk benefits should be documented in the radiology report. Basically, if we are dealing with the imaging outside of the zone between the diaphragm and the knees, that would be the algorithm. Uh, otherwise, physicists might be involved in assessing the exact dose that was delivered to the fetus. So in summary, use of CT and MR has been shown to be safe in pregnancy when appropriate equipment is used. It justified in specific clinical scenarios, and so far, no adverse mother and fetal effect were documented. IV contrast can be used for both CT and MRI with caution, and we should be aware not only of the fetal, but also of maternal and specifically breast radiation. Informed consent of pregnant patients is mandatory. Thank you very much.